What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the NBA opening night DFS preview. I'm Alex Blickle, joined by my good buddy, Zach Graham. Zach, you've been in the NBA preseason streets. It's been going really, really well, so you must be pumped for the start of the real NBA season. Yeah, man, we were uh, we were talking before we started recording this, and I was saying, man, I, I love preseason. I love summer league. Like, all that secondary DFS basketball action is, you know, it's right up my alley, but it can be exhausting when you get hit with the late scratches or, you know, guys coming out after a half, things like that. So I'm ready for the real thing. Um, and I think we've got to, like some of these two game slates to start the NBA regular season can be downer sometimes. Yeah. Not the case here. I, I think on Tuesday. Yeah. We've got a really fun one. I, I think it sets it well from a DFS perspective. And then it's also fun because both or two of these teams have really new key pieces that we've got to try and figure out. And if we can be ahead of the curve on, on those guys and the effect that they'll have Chris Paul and Bradley Beal, then we can make some really good money on opening night. So let's jump right in. First question I have is you know, pricing's kind of soft overall. So I think I know where you're going to go with this answer, but who stands out to you as the most underpriced player or players on this slate? Yeah, I think there's a few we can talk about, right? But as you kind of hinted there, um, and it may sound silly on the surface. I think the most underpriced player on the slate is actually the most expensive player in Nikola Jokic. Um, 10K for Jokic here. It's going to be ring night in Denver. And we know that there's been some offseason back and forth in, you know, on social media and, and through the NBA media, et cetera, between the Nuggets and the Lakers. Denver coming off the sweep of the Lakers in the Western Conference Finals. So both of them are real hoops and a DFS standpoint, we're, we're going to have a lot of attention on this game. Um, Jokic at 10K is, to me, minimum $1,500 too cheap yeah. on this slate. The 11, 5, between 11.5 and 12K is where he resided most of last season, and nothing has happened during the offseason to take any sort of major usage or opportunity away from you know the defending finals MVP and two-time league MVP here, so... 10K for a guy who averaged essentially 60 DK points per game last season with all the eyes on him. And we know that Jokic, you know, he treats it like a job. He doesn't actually care that much. I don't buy into that, man. He, he's going to come in and do his thing. And, and 10K for Jokic, I'm going to have a ton. Um, and I, But I think the field will be there as well because we see the top end of the pricing here a little bit watered down. The, the next guy my eyes gravitate to, Alex, is Anthony Davis on the other side of that mm -hmm. game at 8,900. I think he's about a thousand too cheap, at least here. Um, he's looked uh, just fine in the preseason. So han healthy Anthony Davis sub 9K, I think also stands out. Um, has anybody caught your eye either up top or anywhere else? Because I know there, there's a few names we can mention down at the bottom. Uh, what are you thinking here? So Anthony Davis also caught my eye, and I completely agree, by the way, with Jokic. I think an important point is, you know, you mentioned he spent most of last season like the upper 11,000s, and he was still popular almost every <laughs> slate in those yeah. upper 11,000s. So at $10,000, he's certainly going to get a lot of ownership. I think he's very deserving of that ownership. I think he's going to smash this price tag. I'm curious your thoughts about this Lakers front court. How much Christian Wood are we going to see? How much Wood and Davis together are we going to see? And how do you think Wood's presence is going to affect Anthony Davis's fantasy points per minute? So uh, hardly at all in my eyes. Like Christian Wood is not good from like a real NBA standpoint. I mean, there's a reason this guy who can almost score at will over the past couple of years keeps bouncing around from team to team. And, you know, the guy got he got paid in his last contract, right, and bounced around Texas. And, and I'm hoping as the Spurs fan here that he doesn't ever complete that Texas triangle because I don't need <laughs> Christian Wood on my favorite team. Um, he's not going to start here, and I don't think we see those guys sharing the floor a ton. 
I think Coach Darvin Ham is going to figure out pretty quickly that they don't need a ton of Christian Wood when they're trying to win games. I don't see how he can play really more than 20 minutes night to night if the Lakers are trying to win here. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't have a ton of excitement, and I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I'm, I'm a big 20 max guy when it comes to DFS. I wouldn't be surprised if I have no Christian Wood in my lineups come Tuesday. The only the only way I can see Wood playing a bunch is if Anthony Davis kind of gets his way. Like he he has talked a lot about he seems to prefer playing the four than the five, going and not having to you know bank bodies with those really big guys. Jokic certainly counts there, so that's the only kind of path I see to Christian Wood playing more minutes. But otherwise, I'm with you. Like I, I very much think they're better off with him on the bench. Anthony yeah. Davis playing the five. We'll see. That's the only concern that I have, but I, I think at, before we move on, Alex, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think Jackson Hayes would start at the five before Christian Wood, um, just because of his ability to actually defend somewhat at the yeah. NBA level, like maybe in a different matchup, I, I could get on board with, with Wood maybe starting alongside Davis. Cause I think that's a good, a great point you brought up. Anthony Davis, for whatever reason, considers <laughs> or continues to consider himself a four. And like, I get it my team is running a seven foot four guy at the power forward position this year. But I think Jackson Hayes makes a little bit more sense just from, again, that real life we're trying to win this game standpoint. That's a perfect segue because you mentioned the fact that a lot of the kind of upper pricing tier is soft on a lot of these guys, like almost every single one of these studs in these two games is going to settle into a price a lot higher than what we're seeing on opening night. So if people want to jam in as many of these guys as possible, they're going to have to find ways to save money. Do you think that Jackson Hayes, if he gets the start, would be one of the more popular options? And if not, who else are people going to go to to save some money? here? I think if Hayes did pull the start, and and for what it's worth, I do think Anthony Davis uh, is the starting center on Tuesday. But again, we will see, uh, you know, prior to lock, because this is, oddly enough, the early game. This one is 730 uh, Eastern time in Denver. So that's 530 local, right? Because you've got Phoenix and Golden State also on this slate. Um, so I think Hayes, if he did pull the start, he would be highly owned. I think he would be somewhat muted though, compared to what we might see on a different slate because you've got center only Jokic, you've got center only Anthony Davis and a couple other, uh, you know, viable center eligible plays here. So he would be popular. Um, I do think that Phoenix, uh, especially if we get the starting lineup from Coach Vogel there in Phoenix prior to lock, I think you could see a guy like Eric Gordon at 4,300, Josh Okogie at 4K flat, maybe even Kata Bates Jop or Nas Little, 3 4 and 3 7, respectively. Uh, could and, and Grayson Allen, 4,900. I think whoever gets the start with that star studded cast that, that, you know, they'd be filling in there. Um, I think they will also pick up a, a good amount of ownership and then we'll see about Golden State, right? Like if, if Draymond doesn't play, um, we're going to see a guy like Chris Paul at 5,600 or Jonathan Kaminga at 46. One of those guys is likely to slot in there for Draymond. So I, I think those early on uh, would be my shouts in terms of who's going to be popular uh, in terms of the value. I think you're right about that. And, and I think there's like a very clear – Similarity between this slate and last year's opening night slate where you have a lot of value plays that people can go to. They're certainly viable, but the, they're also not very exciting. And, and certainly you're not playing any of these really cheap guys with the expectation that they win the slate for you. You're just hoping they give you enough such that the studs that you're fitting in can win the slate for you. But I'm curious, do you think that most people are going to try that route, the studs and duds route, or are people going to go balanced where, you know, maybe they're living in like the Chris Paul, Bradley Beal, uh, not not necessarily Christian Wood, but, you know, maybe sure. the Nurkic range or, or Clay Thompson, where they then don't have to go that cheap. And they just say, you know what, maybe some of these guys are underpriced too, or at least they have real ceilings. So what do you think is going to be the more common build, balanced or studs and duds? I, you know, again, I think it depends on what type of news we get in terms of starting lineups and injury reports leading up to, you know, an hour before lock on Tuesday. Um, I think right now I would lean more towards like spending up on one guy, that one guy more often not, than not being Jokic, 
because then I've got about 5,700 left for these other spots. And you mentioned a lot of the names there, whether it's Clay Thompson, 65, Nurkic, 63, Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell at 61 and 6K flat, respectively. MPJ, if he's ready to go, he's also missed the, the, the entire preseason here for Denver. So if MPJ's out, we're going to get somebody like Justin Holiday, which is feels like a pretty stinky value that may go over owned in terms of what he can actually do for us. Yeah. Aaron Gordon, 57. We talked about Chris Paul. Andrew Wiggins is right there at 5,500. And Kaminga is going to be massively owned if Draymond is out and he gets the start. Um, so I think that's where I would lean, especially if I'm building just one lineup here. We're recording this on Thursday afternoon. If I have to build and lock in a lineup right now, I think it's Jokic and I'm filling in around him with some of those guys who are going to get 30, 32 minutes, but have a very, you know, I think we see a lot of the price points on the guys we just mentioned come up a few hundred, maybe a thousand over the next week. Yeah, very good point. Um at the moment, there are 13 questionable tags over $4,000. <laughs> now, a lot of those aren't real questionable tags, right. but there are a few guys that we we really you know, need to wait and see. What do you think the most impactful absence would be that we might actually see on opening night? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a number here. And, and like you mentioned, a lot of these Q tags right now are preseason Q tags where guys have been in and out. And, and DraftKings also doesn't know quite what to make of some of that news. Uh, so I think it'll be a little bit more cleaned up by the time we're really, you know, making our lineups early next week. But a, a couple guys that I wanted to mention, we already brought up Draymond Green. That's going to throw Chris Paul or Jonathan Kaminga into that starting lineup. Jared Vanderbilt is now uncertain with a heel issue for the Lakers. So do they go big? Do they go smaller with a guy like Gabe Vincent? Um, is, is Rui Hachimura getting in there? We already talked about, you know, maybe Jackson Hayes gets out there for the Lakers um, in terms of the other Q tags here. Um, Denver, Christian Brown at 4,400. He's the guy that you would expect to step into that Bruce Brown role, but he's been out the entirety of the preseason. So I mentioned, you know, Justin holiday that also would, I think open up opportunities to take low owned value shots on guys like Peyton Watson and maybe Julian Strother who has been shooting the absolute lights out, not just in the preseason, but going back to his summer league performances. So I think maybe some of those guys on Denver, if, uh, you know, and, and MPJ, if he's out too, right? Like there's going to be some value that opens up if the news breaks a certain way for three of these four teams. And then Phoenix, it's just a matter of which of those value guys is going to be the fifth starter along the big three and, uh, and Yusuf Nurkic. I'm especially intrigued by this late game Phoenix and Golden State because we've got two really big names changing teams, Bradley Beal, Chris Paul. What are the effects that you think these two guys are going to have on their new team? What's their role going to look like? And how does it affect their teammates? I think uh, look, look, I want to start with with Chris Paul because um, mm -hmm. there were certainly questions and I had them as well when the whole, you know, he went to Washington first and then a couple days later he finds himself in Golden State where – the relation between Chris Paul and the Warriors over the last decade or so has been testy at best. Um, so seeing him come in here, it, you know, it, it leaves you, it left me scratching my head a little bit at first, but watching him, whether it's, you know, in practice, his teammates or coaches talking about how he's fitting into this group and then watching him in the preseason, I think he's going to fit really well into this team from a real basketball standpoint. I do think we're going to need him to be in a starting role. So again, that he doesn't need a Clay or a Steph out, right? If Draymond is out, they may go small. We've seen that in the preseason at least once so far. And I expect him to still produce at a fantasy point per minute or maybe a little bit above that in terms of his his daily fantasy production. So I think from both a, you know, a basketball standpoint and a fantasy standpoint, Chris Paul is going to be just fine, especially – at this $5,600 price tag, I think he's still in play, even if he's off the bench yeah. at, at that price, because we know in a starting role, even at this advanced stage of his career, he's like a 7K type of player, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what are your thoughts on Chris Paul? Yeah, so I, I love the last point that you made, that he's he's even viable off the bench. I almost maybe prefer him that way, because mm -hmm. I think it would really lower his ownership. And if he's coming off the bench, like at least then he's going to play more of his minutes, a higher proportion of his minutes without Steph on the floor. Yeah. The ball's going to be in his hands a ton. Regardless, I think one like 
I, I'm not even sure this is a hot take. One prediction that I have for the year is I think Chris Paul will lead the league in assists per minute played. And oh, okay. I mean, it's just such an awesome spot for him from a basketball perspective. I agree with you. I think it's a really cool fit, really good basketball fit. I mean, he has never played with shooters like Steph and Clay. I was about to say that. <laughs> it's it's unbelievable just how effective he can be with that kind of spacing. And I think Steph will really enjoy it too. The ability to play off ball where, you know, he has a guy who's as good as he is at not only delivering passes, but doing it on time, reading the coverage. Because one thing Steph's amazing at is when he's off ball, he reads what his defender's doing. You know, if, if he's coming around a curl and the guy jumps underneath, he knows to fade it. And now he's got a guy who can read those passes exactly as well as Steph can. It's going to be really exciting, I think, to watch those two operate together, to watch Chris Paul operate with Clay Thompson. I think the guy who's hurt the most, honestly, from a fantasy perspective, might be Draymond Green mm -hmm. because Draymond has had a lot of like ball handling and playmaker duties. And when Chris Paul's on the floor, I don't see that going to Draymond. I see it going to Chris Paul. So maybe we should kind of temper our expectations for Draymond's assist rate, at least when those guys are sharing the floor. We'll see how much they share the floor. We'll see how many minutes per game Chris Paul's playing. Maybe Chris Paul's used just more as a stagger from Steph. But personally, I hope we see a lot of Chris Paul and Steph together. I hope we see high minutes for Chris Paul, in which case I think he could be like the opening night GBP winner. Yeah, no, and, and you know, we always see the the clips of Steph, right? Taking a three, turning around, pointing at somebody before it even goes in. We saw something new the other night. He did exactly what you just described, came off a screen. The uh, defender tried to shoot the gap and he faded it. He puts up the, you know, Chris Paul delivers it right on time, as you said. And as the shot, he lets it fly. And instead of turning around, showboating for the crowd or to his teammates, he turns and just points to Chris Paul yep. and starts running back on defense. And of course, the shot goes in. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think the more these guys are playing together here early in the preseason, the more they and I think everybody else watching are starting to get excited about kind of the new puzzle that that Steve Kerr has to figure out here. What do you think of this hot take? Okay. Phoenix will finish first in points per game and last in points allowed per game. I think it's, I think it's lukewarm. Uh, I mean, I think <laughs> that could certainly happen. I do think, uh, especially if when Benyama misses any sort of time, San Antonio is still going to be garbage on defense. Like I think the plus minus numbers there. And again, you're going to get a lot of me just diverting into Wimby talk this season and maybe for the next decade, hopefully. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think they, they could certainly be down there um, with the likes of Houston and, and San Antonio and maybe a Charlotte, a Washington, right? These teams that I still expect to be near the bottom of the league. Um, they're just going to have, I mean, how many points can this team average now with Bradley Beal in the mix? Like it's, it's, they're certainly more potent offensively, and it may sound weird on the surface, but I think in terms of scoring points, Bradley Beal helps them more than Chris Paul did at, at this stage of his career. Are you at all concerned for them offensively, at, just in the start of the year? I don't think it's a long-term concern, that they don't really have a true point guard, so maybe it's, you know, there's a little hesitation or confusion of exactly what that offense should look like, or are these guys just so damn talented offensively that they're just going to hit the ground running? I mean, more towards the latter, especially because we've seen Devin Booker play point guard w when Chris Paul is out or even before he was there for extended periods of time, you know, weeks at a time and be very successful, at least statistically at doing that. And I also we're going to see some point Beal here this season yeah. too, watching their first couple of games when these guys have played together. It's only been two times and they haven't gotten extended, you know, they haven't played a full game yet, but it really looks like Beal's going to be that guy that comes out four or five minutes into the game. And then he's going to run some point mm -hmm. on that second unit because not only is Chris Paul gone, campaign is also in Milwaukee now. And they didn't really do anything to sew up that point guard yeah. position behind those two guys. Like Jordan Goodwin can be a very exciting fantasy asset as can Saban Lee. But I don't think either of those guys are getting huge minutes. Goodwin has, I think the leg up there in terms of being mm -hmm. an actual rotation player, but that's why, and I know, you know, a few minutes ago you asked about Paul and Beal. I think Beal is going to be a really interesting fantasy asset too because he's going to get that time at the point guard where in Washington we did not see a ton of that. He was typically playing off ball throughout his tenure in Washington. 
Yeah, it's also really interesting with Beal because like Chris Paul, he's seen a really large price decrease. You know, typically low to mid 8,000 is now 6,900 to open the season. And I think you can make a case that, yeah, the usage for him is almost definitely going to go down, but the assist rate might go up and the efficiency scoring wise might go up just being in this offense. And if, if they're scoring 140 points per night, you don't need a whole lot of usage to produce. <laughs> so I, I think he's an intriguing one at 6,900 to start the year. And I think for me, it's really going to be ownership dependent. Do people flock to this price tag or do they just say, eh, with Booker and Durant, Beal's kind of the odd man out and they, they shy away from this price tag, in which case I might be all over. Yeah, I think that is probably what we see play out uh, on Tuesday again as where we sit here on Thursday with the news. And, and man, you talk about underpriced plays, not to gloss over these guys earlier, but like Durant 8-4, Booker 8-3, both of those guys feel like values at their prices as well. And we know the sites do this early in the season on opening night to kind of reel everybody in. <laughs> you know, we're getting a little bit of a different taste. No, no NFL on this Tuesday. It's all NBA opening night. So come get you some 10K Jokic, get you some 8,400 KD, you know, et cetera. So I think, mm-hmm. I think you're spot on there that, that maybe those mid 8K price tags on the two bigger names out of this trio live, leave Beal as the odd man out and point guard only eligibility for Beal. Yeah. Uh, it's just another hurdle to, you know, the masses getting getting some ownership there. 100%. What do you think of Yusuf Nurkic and then also Kavan Looney? Now, we know, you know, Looney would be a, a phenomenal. What's your thought if Draymond's in? And then, you know, what do you just think of Nurkic's role here? Is there is there enough to go around for him? Or can he just produce enough with rebounds, putbacks, and then defensive stats? I think Looney is going to be interesting regardless of Draymond's status because we know he's, you know, a very solid fantasy producer. The minutes can sometimes be a little bit limited by matchup, but you would expect him to probably match minutes with Yusuf Nurkic. And I guess it remains to be seen how much Vogel actually uses Yusuf Nurkic because can I interest you in a Kevin Durant at the five lineup? If we're not stopping anybody in the first place, Alex, why not put KD out there and 140, nah, 150, 155, yeah. let, let's do it. Um, so I think Yusuf Nurkic, while he's out there, he is well above a fantasy point per minute producer in his career. I mean, this is a guy that at his height, right, uh, it, or I should say his peak, right, his prime, he's been hampered by injuries the last couple of years. But this is a guy who was a legit triple-double threat on some nights in Portland a few years ago. So, again, I'm not putting in the call for that here, but I think 6,300 um, – and again, those other center only guys that we have on this slate, I think he could be really interesting in, from a tournament perspective here on Tuesday um, because we've we've seen him. Uh, uh, he put up some some huge fantasy performances. I mean, uh, ten days ago in the preseason, we had Portland and Phoenix. So I'm all about oh DeAndre Ayton, right? <laughs> Dominating. He he's coming uh, to to get his revenge. No, no, no. Yusuf Nurkic is the one that puts up the big game. So uh, he's looking spry. And and while Nurkic is healthy, again, he's a very efficient fantasy producer. So I think I have a little bit more interest in Nurkic because I think he's got the higher game-to-game upside compared to a guy like Kavon Looney, especially here in the regular season, right? Looney is that that guy in the playoffs who's grabbing us 16 boards, you know, playing all the minutes like the regular season – Steve Kerr usually pulls back on the reins a little bit. So it would be Nurkic for me there, um, even with price considered. There was a fun meme going around Twitter the other day. It was like, which NBA lineup would be best? And they took current lineups and then just swapped out one starter for one like historical great player from that team. Phoenix is, instead of the, the Grayson Allen or Josh Okogi, you know, wing spot, they brought in Steve Nash. So Nash, Beal, Booker, <laughs> Durant. My comment was, oh, my God, every single game would be 165 to 155. Yes. I, be, if, if I can play that real so quick. Bad, but I do think that if we want to start the season with the thought, let's just stack every Phoenix game because they're going to score a ton of points and give up a ton of points, I feel like that's pretty viable. I, I absolutely agree with that, and I think that's something we should be factoring in here from a game environment standpoint, uh, and not just on opening night, right? Like you said, going forward uh, throughout maybe one of those things we can take advantage of early in the season. If I can put in my entry for that little swap game that you just brought up, get Nurkic out of there, 
bring me the round mound of rebound to run up and down with these guys and put Charles Barkley with this big three. Yeah, that'd be really fun. He'd give you a, a little bit of uh, toughness too that I think they're Exactly, needed. exactly. <laughs> All right, I think that will do it for opening night. Any closing thoughts about the slate? Maybe a, a GPP winner type call. Yeah, I mean, I think this is certainly not going to be a hot take if the news that Draymond is out comes, you know, hours before lock. But Jonathan Kaminga has looked fantastic uh, early in this preseason. And again, it's not a one-to-one comparison between preseason and regular season ball. But Kaminga's always been a guy that intrigues us statistically. And we've seen big tournament winning performances from him before. Um, and so if he is actually taking that leap this year, I think he's the guy that I have. I have my eyes on right now is potentially loading up on Jonathan Kaminga if the news breaks right. I like it. I think my my GPP winning take, if you will, uh, this early. Now, obviously, we don't know ownership yet, so maybe ownership will kind of reflect exactly what I'm thinking. But I have a feeling that the new guys, Beal, Nurkic, Chris Paul, will all be heavily underowned. I want to be way over the field on all three guys. If I had to pick one of those guys to be the GPP winner, it would be Chris Paul. But I also think he's the most likely to be popular. So we'll have to wait and see. But super excited for opening night. In the meantime, go Phillies. We'll catch you next time. 